I will first start with saying out some of the features of today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded. There is international sign interpretation, language interpretation in English and Bhasha. A CC button on your screen will enable the captions. If you need captions in a different window, the links is in the chat box. Kindly take a few seconds to enable the language of your own choice in the language options again at the bottom of your screen. There will be an option to mute original audio. Please do not select this option. If you do, you might miss some parts of the audio. So let's take 10 seconds so you can start the language of your own choice in the language options. Should you have any questions for panelists, kindly use the Q&A option or leave your question in the chat box. Our team is monitoring both and will try to respond to questions in the course of the event where possible. We hope to have time for questions wherein participants may be invited to ask questions. Please note, we cannot put camera on for the participants due to the limitations on the platform where time is an issue. Priority will be given to live answering. Questions that are relevant to the discussion will have been presented. Should you have any accessibility issues, please send a private message to the host account or email at webinars at the rate ida-secretariat.org and the team will try to resolve to their best of their ability. <clears throat> we request all the speakers to kindly keep to times and to ensure that they speak slow enough for the interpreters and captioners to follow. We would, uh, we would like to thank the logistic and communication teams at the International Disability Alliance for their hard work and consideration in enabling the participation of all of us here today. <clears throat> I thank all our eminent speakers who have joined today for this regional event on deinstitutionalization and human degrading treatment. To contribute to the GD GDS Youth Summit, and preparing youth with disabilities for deinstitutionalization. My name is Vakar Puri, and I am based in Pakistan, and I'm working with Transforming Communities for Inclusion as a Senior Programs Manager. <clears throat> as you know that youth with mental, intellectual, multiple psychosocial disabilities, users and survivors of psychiatry, and those with intersectional neurodiverse identities are still left behind. In this context of in the context of the human rights and inclusion. Institutionalization is a reality in many countries and is growing massively in middle income countries, particularly through new and private institutions. Youth with psychosocial disabilities and children with intellectual disabilities are more commonly found in mental asylums, rehabilitation centers, clinics, nursing homes, and a variety of care institutions. <clears throat> facing a long-term confinement and isolation, physical and chemical restraint. In developing countries like Pakistan, um, India, and uh, uh, Nepal, where there are very limited resources available, uh, children with disabilities are taken as burden on their families and are forced to live in institutions for the rest of their lives. And in the institutions, children have poor health, hygiene, bad appetite, rely on charities for their lifetime, no access to quality education and face abuse inside the institutions. The objectives behind organizing today's session is to highlight the situation of youth with disabilities and raise a voice at the regional level to emphasize on having a CRPD compliant based, the CRPD compliant community based services for enabling environments for youth with disabilities in our communities and deinstitutionalization. This youth summit will, uh, will be a unique platform for all of us to create a dialogue between multiple stakeholders to work on the solution or different solutions for deinstitutionalization and how we can include youth with disabilities in the mainstream societies who still continue to face exclusion in their societies. We look forward to collaborating with the organizations working on this subject and bringing the agenda forward for the inclusion of persons with disabilities. I would now uh, like to introduce to our first speaker, Mr. Agus Hidayat. Agus is a youth uh, disability rights activist 
focusing on the rights of persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities in Indonesia. He works with youth with psychosocial disabilities through peer support group programs, social media campaigns, disability rights advocacy, and awareness campaigns to, uh, to raise the issues of persons with psychosocial disabilities to the public. August is founder of Remisi, an OPD of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. He has been involved in alternative reporting and monitoring of the implementation of the CRPD. He has also been working with the government of Indonesia for advocating for the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, I request August to uh, uh, take the floor. Uh, over. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Wakar. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me well. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good uh, evening. Uh, today, I'm going to show you uh, the situation of person with uh, psychosocial disability. Um, um, I'm going to share. Um, uh, uh, my uh, presentation. Uh, so today I'm going uh, to talk about the situation of uh, youth with psychosocial disabilities uh, within social care uh, institution in Indonesia. Um, um, uh, in developing countries, uh, institutionalization uh, is uh, very different. Uh, let's say if we compare uh, to Europe or to or in the USA, which more like a, more like a mental hospital. Uh, but today I'm going to uh, present the reality of how torture and uh, inhuman or degrading treatment are cruel reality in Indonesia. And spoiler alert. Uh, if you are a person who lives with experience, it might be uh, triggering you, but I hope not. So uh, I hope this is going to be a great discussion for Valentine's Day. So yeah, uh, um, uh, the situation, uh, social care institution in Indonesia is more uh, common and there are uh, hundreds of them. Uh, there is no specific data about how many people live uh, within the social care institution, but I'm assuming uh, there are uh, probably like 20,000 uh, people who live uh, within the social care institution. It's only for uh, people uh, with or person with psychosocial disabilities uh, only. Uh, according to Human Rights Watch, there was uh, 40,000 uh, people who live uh, in uh, social care institution in 2016, but we don't really know uh, to be exact the number right now because uh, we don't really uh, uh, have the opportunity to uh, get the data. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the arbitrary detention or for uh, institutionalization. Suckling uh, is a uh, remain count practice. Uh, uh, will I will show you uh, in the next slide. Uh, torture and violence, uh, which is five, uh, physical violence, uh, psychological, sexual, and economic violence, uh, malnutrition uh, uh, within the institutionalization, and forced treatment and medication, under medicalization, physical health uh, problem, poor sanitation, uh, no limit of detention, uh, segregation, and uh, uh, and, and all of them. And uh, for those of you who can see, uh, the left picture uh, is uh, a young woman with psychosocial disability uh, who I. Uh, visit uh, in uh, last year and uh, he she doesn't really know anything about uh, what really happened in the world such as a pandemic situation uh, so yeah um, the next uh, uh, slide is uh, the situation uh, the source of the pictures is from living in hell human rights watch in 2016 uh, Institutionalization in Indonesia is uh, very cruel and prison-like or resemble like a cage. This practice, uh, arbitrary detention or forced institutionalization is legal. And this illegal detention center as a social care institution is legalized and approved by the government. Suckling remain a common practice. Usually people with psychosocial disabilities uh, are in chain. Uh, abuse and physical violence are experienced by many people with psychosocial disabilities in social care uh, institution. Uh, in confinement, some of, some of them are sexually assaulted and receive multiple sexual violence from a few people who were there as quote-unquote nurse. They don't have privacy. 
there are not a lot to have private stuff such as phone and their access to information is very limited. Some women, they don't get sanitary napkin during their periods. That one that I found, uh, that I uh, got the information when I visited uh, a social care institution last year. I can see some blood in their room during my last visit. The lack of women who works as a social care worker is one of the main issues uh, in Indonesia. Some rape cases could not be reported uh, as well because they are scared uh, to make a report. And a few uh, women with psychosocial disability who get unwanted pregnant has to give birth during confinement. And yes, they will take uh, uh, the child because uh, the mother uh, uh, is considered is not sane enough, quote unquote, uh, to take care of uh, the baby. Uh, malnutrition and malpractices are faced by them. Chain, roof, and unhealthy food are considered enough for them. The medication in a few social care institutions are forcefully given without diagnosis or medical assessment. Yet in some other social care institutions, no, medica no medication or uh, medicine is not allowed at all because they use traditional or forced uh, religious treatment to quote unquote cure them as a person who lives with mental illness. Poor sanitation, malnutrition, torture, and violence, of course, will affect their health, body, physically, and um, mentally. Um, the next slide. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, here is uh, the, situa the situation of uh, youth with uh, psychosocial disabilities that I uh, visited last year uh, during uh, pandemic. And uh, uh, a lot of people uh, who live uh, within social care institution, they are being punished and tortured and not because they did uh, uh, any criminal. Uh, it is because they are a person with psychosocial disabilities. So this is a disability punishment. It's not a criminal punishment. And there is no limit of detention could make person with psychosocial disabilities to live. Uh, they could be uh, in the detention center uh, until they die. Uh, overcapacity is one of the issues uh, in some social care institu institution and in uh, some other social care institution, the resident is not too many, but uh, they stay uh, in uh, uh, something like in a cage. I would say it's cage uh, uh, instead of a uh, room. One of them who lived there uh, told me, uh, I would rather get shot uh, in the head rather than uh, living like this for uh, forever. Uh, because there is no future in here. Um, and uh, some of them uh, are still hoping for their family to come and release them, or they are just there because they don't know their, where their families are. And they are not just forgotten, but also they are segregated from the uh, society. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the uh, picture in, 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 in the left uh, 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 where you can see a door. It's uh, where is the suckling uh, process um, uh, is um, uh, uh, practices in, 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 uh, in some social care institution. And uh, this uh, picture uh, on your right, uh, it is uh, uh, felt more like a prison and a cage, to be honest, uh, rather than a social care institution. And this is a real a reality in Indonesia that I uh, really have to uh, show you. Um, uh, the cause of the uh, well, the, the institutionalization uh, in Indonesia, of course, is uh, the stigma and discrimination, lack of knowledge from uh, the society, from the family, and from the people who live with uh, uh, psychosocial disability as well. Uh, the economic uh, also uh, is one of the uh, main issue uh, and paternalistic uh, culture and power relations because youth are uh, in a less uh, power uh, relations. Uh, usually uh, um, uh, uh, within uh, the family. So uh, young persons with psychosocial disabilities are uh, very uh, uh, usually dependent on family support due to uh, difficulties in finding and keep a job. Yet sometimes uh, psychosocial disabilities have to be uh, hidden even from our own families due to uh, the stigma. And for some of us who do not have 
uh, enough support. They face all forms of violence and have no independence at all uh, because or our families can violate our rights and they can put uh, ourselves uh, to the social care institution. Often our thoughts and opinions are ignored because maybe uh, they think that we are young uh, and our legal capacity is ultimately is abolished. Uh, and in some regions, they are caged because they are considered uh, um, not sane, quote unquote, sane enough. Uh, thousands of young people with psychosocial disability are still living in the institution today. I am not sure how many of them to be exact as well as our government. Um, a young person with psychosocial disabilities rarely have the opportunity to participate equally in the society as this due to uh, preconceived notions and stigma about our identities. They are not considered as a person with disability, but they are considered as a person who have mental illness. Identity of person with psychosocial disability is often associated with it being uh, dangerous or less than human or, or incapable um, and yeah. And there are a lot of uh, stigma around uh, uh, the society regarding uh, person uh, or young uh, young young person with psychosocial disabilities. So the impact um, the impact is of course one is losing our uh, legal capacity and our civil rights as a person. Uh, torture, violence, uh, health, uh, both physically and mentally, uh, and uh, people who live within uh, the social care institution has potentially in prison or in a cage until they die. And they uh, have no life at all. They, they no have a meaningful life. Uh, they can be, uh, uh, when I ask uh, people who live there, they have been living in there for one year, five year, uh, 20 years or 30 years. When I ask someone uh, who, uh, who were uh, 60 at the time and uh, she said that, she has been living in there for 30 years. And then, uh, so uh, uh, she started um, uh, the, uh, enter the institutionalization uh, or social care institution at the age of 30. This is quite scary and a serious threat for a young person with uh, psychosocial disabilities. Um, during this pandemic and lockdown, their uh, invisibility has been uh, further compounded. Uh, the lack of access to health care for young persons with psychosocial disability has been uh, more exacerbated. Some of social care institutions refuse uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, this is more than a serious problem that we need to address and solve. Uh, and um, uh, in the next slide, um, uh, I would like to show you uh, two different, totally different picture. Uh, uh, on the left picture, uh, there is uh, me, of course, uh, and um, my friend who is a celebrity who are uh, who is uh, speak uh, about mental health, very uh, uh, strong mental health advocate, and, uh, and 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 the right girl is uh, uh, who already graduated from um, medical uh, um, school, and uh, uh, my friends uh, who live. Uh, in Jakarta, uh, uh, on my right uh, is graduated from uh, uh, psychology, uh, and then uh, the right picture is a person who live um, uh, within uh, confinement and uh, shuffling. So, what make us the different? Uh, I think um, um, uh, uh, there is no different uh, at all. The different is uh, only one. Is a support. It's a support on education. Uh, it's support to make us uh, get a uh, like a true job and make enough for a living. Uh, it's a health support, financial support, social support, friends or family, uh, like peer support, social services, and you know any other uh, range of support services that we need in our community, like uh, community-based uh, services. Um, um, uh, what we need uh, in my uh, next slide, uh, the first one is legal reform. Uh, uh, second one, uh, specific day institutionalization programs, uh, range of super services uh, that I've uh, mentioned before in uh, the previous slide, and advanced uh, social protection. Um, advanced social protection programs such as uh, uh, disability allowance, concession card, public housing, and many other inclusive social protection schemes. Uh, it's more. Uh, um, uh, it, it's what we need uh, to um, uh, 
to uh, fulfill our rights and uh, we need uh, the legal reform uh, and we have to ban uh, um, uh, torture for uh, base uh, psych uh, psychosocial disability because in Indonesia we already ratified uh, not only CRPD but uh, also the convention against torture and funding on uh, for empowerment program to connect them to the job is also uh, needed and uh, of course a range of support uh, uh, services uh, thank you uh, i'm uh, really happy uh, to uh, give uh, the floor back to you uh, walker thank you so much thank you august thank you so much for uh, sharing your views on the um, situation of persons with psychosocial disabilities uh, in Indonesia and especially uh, women with psychosocial disabilities. And I think there is a dire need to, you know, aware the governments, the society on uh, deinstitutionalization and promote um, as many as CRPD based community based services programs. Um, um, and the point you mentioned about the harassment and uh, raping women with psychosocial disabilities in the institution, uh, this should also be addressed on a priority basis. Um, and and as, as you mentioned, thousands of uh, people with psychosocial disabilities and intellectual disabilities are uh, living within the institutions who are subject to violence and uh, ha they have no access to information. They will not have access to uh, health services, no access to education services, no access to employment. Um, um, and I totally agree with you uh, with the, uh, the points you mentioned about our needs. Uh, I think this is very basic that uh, we should have uh, legal reforms, uh, social protection, access to social protection, and deinstitutionalization programs. I think having deinstitutionalization uh, deinstitutionalization programs is uh, a start, and once we have those in place, um, uh, it will you know uh, help the governments and also the civil society and uh, organizations. Uh, working in Indonesia to you know uh, to transform the uh, this uh, uh, transform from institutionalization to deinstitutionalization. Uh, I thank you uh, once again uh, for you know sharing your views on uh, uh, institutionalization. Uh, I will now proceed to uh, 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 with providing the floor to the second speaker, Mr. Beck. Uh, Mr. Beck is a deaf person living in Korea. He received his uh, a bachelor degree in social welfare from Hang Yang University and is currently serving as a rely interpreter for the deaf at the Seodam Gyu Sign Language Interpretation Center in Seoul. He is in charge of case management by interpreting and consulting for the deaf. He is president of WFD uh, for the social development of Asian and young people living with hearing impairments. He will be speaking on what are the impacts of Korean sign language laws, especially when people are people with hearing impairment uh, access health services. For example, when they visit to uh, hospitals or any uh, treatment places, he will also share examples of how people uh, with hearing impairment are subject to degrade treatment in Korea and Asia. Um, over to you, Mr. Bay. Please take the floor. Over. So I would like to share with you all on the from the Asian perspective for the on the youth community on the situation that we are facing. So this is some of the problems that we uh, encounter. So first of all, as we can um, as we um, perhaps all know, during our, our election, we have our kind of proposed for the one of, to talk about one of the, some of the during the presidential debate during our presidential debate, there were no um, sign language interpreter being, being provided. So what happened was that um, the deaf were not being able to participate or able to watch what was happening. And um, a lot of missing information happened, leading to a lot of issue, issues because there were four candidates during the presidential debate, and it was a difficult to follow without an interpreter. And uh, at the large hospitals, whereby we see that the professional sign language 
interpreters are absent and they are not provided at hospitals in the country. So when a deaf person needs to see a doctor and um, communication has always been a problem, especially the lack of uh, interpreters who are professional and uh, written communication is also difficult for the deaf person. And therefore, having an interpreter at hospitals for medical services is important. And for schools, the situation we can see that most of the, the schools are hearing hearing, they do not, the hearing teachers are not proficient in sign language. So for a deaf student person, when he or she attends a school, it's very hard to follow what's happening in class or the classroom learning. It's one that's been stifling for the deaf. I think this is something that we see across uh, many countries. And also in, and in South Korea, what we saw was that we have recognized um, in Just to clarify, so, so seven years ago, in a sign language, Korean sign language, it's recognized. And therefore, now we are moving towards the changing of the system in education whereby to provide in, in sign language in schools. For, but the teachers who are hearing has difficulty communicating using sign language. Another issue that we face at work, our employment, I think in cross of, cross South, across Asia Pacific, we can see whether you're a, a blind person, those who are in wheelchair, opportunities are quite, are much lesser. Similarly for the deaf person, we see communication being a barrier. Many companies find it a, a reason to, as, to, as to why they do not want to hire a deaf person in to their organization. And this creates a lot of problem that the government is working towards propose, proposing the need for anti-discrimination policies or whereby to encourage the co companies to actually hire deaf people. So this is something that we are moving towards and, and the situation that we had in the past and what we want to change. Similarly, across South Asia Pacific, what we see is that there's a need for that's right, let me retract. So there's a need for sign language interpreters who are professional. And we see that in, uh, for example, at banks, and if, for example, if there is a, uh, a card credit card uh, situation, they, they, they will call the client or the, cust the customer to verify a transaction, but that person is unable to pick up the call. So what happens is that it is not possible to actually communicate with the bank offices um, to, to verify a transaction. And um, hope when, when we tell them that can we use a text message instead, they say, no, we need to use a voice recognition. It has to be, and that creates a lot of, of barriers for deaf customer whenever a bank calls them for verification. And um, because of that, we see the need for having this sign language across in also in court situations, we see that, that sign language is being recognized and therefore we hope and wish to have it being used across in the different institutions from bank, from the um, um, courts, et cetera. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, the next slide here, this is on television. This, this is a screenshot of what's happening on, whereby, whereby we have interpreters at, on television with a very small embedded video. So in the past, for example, in, in, during the Winter Olympics, or actually just recently, we can see the Winter Olympics is happening in China and Beijing. The interpreter, it's provided with 50-50% screen ratio. So there's a signer, 50% being shared on the screen. So that provides accessibility because it's, it's visually clearer and the deaf is able to watch it. All right. So the presentation by our, our speaker, Mr. Bake, he has completed on, with this, with, on, on his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bake. 
Um, thank you for sharing the challenges uh, faced by people with hearing impairment and highlighting how deaf people miss accessing the information at different places. Uh, for example, hospitals. I think having access to health services is a very basic and fundamental human right. Um, um, uh, if governments are not being able to uh, provide interpreter, interpre uh, interpreters at the hospitals, uh, they must have, uh, you know, there must be provisions of providing reasonable accommodations uh, so that deaf people can, you know, access uh, the health services on an equal basis to others. Um, also, thank you for highlighting that um, uh, uh, that there is a need to, uh, you know, train the um, interpreters in the schools so that deaf people can also have access to quality education services. And, and also, um, there must be a uh, 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 provision of uh, a deaf uh, uh, there must be uh, availability of interpreters at the workplaces so that people with hearing impairment have access to uh, health, uh, uh, to the employment services. We now have a video uh, on the 10 principles of good treatment of children and adolescents with disabilities developed by UNICEF. I request the backend team to please play the video. well-being and development. Principle 1. The UN Secretary-General Special Envoy on Disability and Accessibility and UNICEF present children and adolescents with disabilities from around the world reading 10 principles for their protection, well-being and development. Principle 1. You're that guy. I exist as I am. I am a person just like you. I deserve to be respected and have my diversity valued. I have the same human rights as you and everyone else. Principle 2. I like that you're kind to me. Love me and play with me. You would like to be loved and treated equally too. Have my best interests at heart and enjoy life with me. Principle 3. I like that you take care of me, protect me, and teach me how to protect myself. I will also be there for you in my own way. In my own way. Principle 4. I want you to accept me as I am, help me develop my abilities and talents, and give me a good quality education. I'm happy when you see my strengths. And help me to engage with others. This is with others. Principle 5. I like that you listen to me, explain things to me, and consider my opinion. This makes me feel safe and helps me learn and develop. Principle 6. Morning. I like that you believe in me and you help me grow. Yes, for. This strengthens my self-esteem, my capacity, and my autonomy. Principle 7. I like that you understand me. Support me and reassure me when I'm upset, angry or frustrated. Often it is in these moments that I need you the most. Principle 8. I like that you include me. I want to live in a friendly, peaceful and inclusive environment and for you to respect and support how I communicate best. Principle 9. I want you to respect me and protect me from all forms of violence everywhere and all the time. Just like anyone else, my body, my soul and my mind deserve to be protected. protected. Principle 10. It matters to me that you believe me. I need to be trusted, just like you. These 10 principles are part of a new campaign initiated by Maria Soledad Cisternas Reyes, the UN Secretary General Special Envoy on Disability and Accessibility, to promote good treatment of children and adolescents with disabilities. Uh. 
Alice, Alice. Man, eh? Journey. Outtakes of the children with disabilities. Special thanks to UNICEF country offices in Bhutan, Brazil, Croatia, Egypt, Kazakhstan, Oman, Paraguay and South Africa. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the backend team for uh, playing uh, this wonderful video for us. I already see so many uh, requests for providing this link to uh, so many uh, participants who are attending this webinar today, uh, you will definitely receive the link for this uh, video in the chat box. Um, I would now move to our next speaker, Ms. Yuni Asaka, a junior research fellow at the Donald Basley Institute. Her primary role involves working on the disabled person-led monitoring of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and Reimagining Parenting Project. Ms. Umi graduated with a Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Otago in 2019. Her particular interest is supporting young people and families to build healthy relationships with each other. She moved to New Zealand when she was 15 years old. Having lived experience of disability and cultural diversity, she was passionate about envisioning and working towards a society where no one is left behind and her work has been through research, activism, and community work. I would request Ms. Uni to take the floor and share some best practices on deinstitutionalization and independent living. Over to you, Ms. Uni. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Mr. Puri. Thank you. So today I'm going to present to you about the disabled people's deinstitutionalization and independent living movement in Japan. And unlike other um, fantastic panelist presentation, I'm going to take you through a brief history of the movement in Japan. So some of the things are not contemporary um, situation. So next slide, please. Before I start, a content warning that I will be talking about abuse and intentional murders of disabled people in this presentation. So please um, take care of yourself if you are not feeling so well. Next slide, please. Um, although the topic for this presentation is called the best practice for the institutionalization, unfortunately, Japan is still far from being completely deinstitutionalized. According to the Ministry of Welfare in Japan, 1.7% of people with physical disabilities, 7.2% of people with psychosocial disabilities, and 12.1% of people with learning disability live in institutions currently. As you would expect, there are lots of cases of abuse and neglect within these institutions. The worst example of this was some, as some of you may have of this, in six. 2016, 19 people with complex disabilities were murdered in an institution by an ex-worker of the institution in Sagamihara, Japan. This was a huge shock to all of us in Japan, but also a reminder of the structural issues of the institutions. Oh, so the next slide, please. And, okay. In the... While the institutions still exist in Japan, we also have a strong disability movement, an organization which led fundamental part of the disability movement is called Aoi Shibanukai, the National Association of People with Cerebral Palsy, which formed in 1957. They started by organizing study groups and camps. They also produced newsletters, which people were able to write to. The association started with a focus of building connection with each other, but they became more radical from an instant in 1970. Next slide, please. 
Um, a mother killed her daughter with cerebral palsy when she could not take care of her anymore. When she appeared in court, there was a movement by the public who helped, felt sympathy for her, and they appealed to reduce her sentence. The association counteracted this public opinion to say that our lives matter, so that she should be sentenced with murder. Next slide, please. In the same year, there was a protest at Fuchu Rehabilitation Center. It was a big institution built in 1968. The institution was going to be shifted to a more remote place in Tokyo. The treatment of disabled mm -hmm. people living there was already horrible, and the residents feared that by moving far away from the center of Tokyo, the treatment could become even worse. A few residents with cerebral palsy, including two siblings, Isao and Kuniko Nita, protested against the shift. They also demanded to be treated as human. Then they came out of the institutions, which sparked consciousness towards the institutionalization in wider community, disabled community in Japan. At this time, people with disability mainly only lived either in institutions or with their families. However, their protests shed the light on the struggles by people with disabilities in institutions, especially with people with significant impairments. And the movements and struggle towards the institutionalization started. There were no systems by the government to provide support workers or financial support for disabled people to live in the community then. So they gathered volunteers by themselves on the street, and that's how they lived day by day. The member of Aoshima no Kai visited other people with disabilities in institutions or their homes to convince them to also move out and live independently in the community. There were many prominent members of the group, but two main members are called Hiroshi Yokota and Koichi Yokotsuka. As the movement grew, Ms. Yokota came up with five principles that they based their movement on, and I would like to introduce them to you. Um, next, next slide, or maybe a few slides ahead, sorry. So the first, we identify ourselves as people with cerebral palsy. By doing this, we recognize our position as an existence which should not exist in this modern society. We believe that this recognition should be the starting point of our whole movement, and we act on this belief. Second, we assert ourselves aggressively. By this means, when we identify ourselves as people with cerebral palsy, we have a will to protect ourselves. We believe that the strong self-assertion in the, the way in, is the only way to achieve self-protection, and we act on this belief. Third, we deny love and justice. We condemn egoism held by love and justice. We believe that neutral understanding accompanying the human observation which arises from the denial of love and justice means a true well-being, and we act on this belief. Fourth, we do not choose the way of problem solving. We have learned from our personal experiences that easy solution to problems lead to dangerous compromises. We believe that an endless confrontation is the only course of action possible for us, and we act on this belief. Five, we deny able-bodied civilization. We recognize that Modern civilization has managed to sustain itself only by excluding us, people with cerebral palsy. We believe that creation of our own culture through our movement and daily life leads to condemnation of modern civilization, and we act on this belief. Okay. Um, these principles may sound very radical and surprising to a lot of, lots of you, and there is a lot of context to understand how this came about. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to unpack these principles with you today. However, it is important to recognize that the foundation of disability movement in Japan 
has been led by people with significant impairments, especially with people with cerebral palsy. These principles have inspired many people with cerebral palsy across many people with disabilities, sorry, across Japan, and movement grew rapidly. People felt empowered by the principle to challenge the discrimination and prejudice that prevented them from having autonomy in life. These people paved the way to create precedent in Japan that disabled people can live in the community. Around this time, a center for independent living was forming in the States. More than 100 people with disability went to the States over the course of several years to learn from their centers about how they organize independent living. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And when they came back, they decided to build independent living centers <clears throat> in Japan also. The first CIL was started in 1986 in Tokyo. They lobbied the government to build the system to provide pay support workers so that they are able to live in the community. They formed a national-wide organization called Japan Council on Independent Living Center. Currently, there are about 130 independent living centers in Japan. They are run by disabled people for disabled people. Next slide, please. They offer peer counseling support, daily life skill program, advocacy for people to gain government funding, manage their funding to provide support workers, and recruit and train support workers. These centers were mainly started by people with physical disabilities, and so there are a higher number of people with physical disability living in the community out of the institutions. However, there is more focus on supporting people with learning disabilities and psychosocial disabilities to also live in the community these days, especially after the incident in Sagamihara. Recently, more businesses have also joined to provide support workers to disabled people. Next slide, please. Oh, the one after, please. The funding people can receive differs based on the local government. But when there is a president, people are much more likely to receive bigger funding package that allows autonomy in life. One of the funding package is called Judo Hormon Kaigo, which means support provided at home for people with severe disabilities. It is similar to the PA system in Sweden, where people can recruit their own support workers and pay for them. And there is a lot more liberty in how people can use the support work hours. This system is quite advanced, but unfortunately, it is only available in certain parts mm. of Japan so far. For example, my mother uses funding package, this funding package, and she receives about 17 hours a day, every day, and she is living independently in Hokkaido, Japan. There are a few other people who use 24-7 support in her community, and because of the collective need and advocacy, this has been possible. The original movement in Japan for the institutionalization was underpinned by strong will to live in this world and challenge the discrimination. The time has moved on and the society is slowly catching up with some of their, this message. And we have the United Nations Convention on the Persons with rights for persons with disability and different mechanisms that protect the rights of people with disabilities across the world. However, we still have a long way to go in achieving world where the institutionalization is completed. I am very grateful to have this opportunity today to present you and in the hope that together one day we can achieve the world without institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Yuni. Uh, thank you for emphasizing on the right to live independently and uh, independent living centers and how independent living centers can, you know, promote 
towards inclusive communities and how people with disabilities can live uh, 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 live on uh, live a life on the equal basis to others. And as we know that Article 19 of the CRPD is a heart uh, for all persons with disabilities. And as you mentioned that um, uh, 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 the, the principles, uh, the most important one uh, was on the identity, I think. And uh, because identity is uh, the beginning, if, uh, if there is, unless we have an identity, things may not change for us in the uh, society and even negotiating with the governments and advocates, advocate, advocating with the governments. Um, you also highlight the, highlighted the involvement of diverse disabilities in consultations, which is again a very important uh, aspect for the disability inclusive development. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would now request Ms. Amulaya, uh, care lever from Udayan Care uh, India, and Ms. Lina Prasad from uh, Udayan Care. India to take the floor for uh, next presentation. Um, Ms. Amulaya is a woman living with epilepsy. Overcoming all her limitations, Amulaya has enabled herself into different sports and participated in various sports competitions for children with disabilities, winning numerous awards, certificates, and laurel alongside many known sports personalities. Uh, Ms. Amulaya presented in India in the World Summer Games for Disabled Young Adults in Athletes in March 2019, um, where she won a bronze medal uh, in a 100-meter race and backed a fourth position. Currently, she's pursuing a vocational course in, hospi in hospitality in India. Um, she is hopeful of excelling in this field and built a career. Moreover, she has been awarded with a scholarship to pursue higher education. Amulaya came across as an inspiration to many children with disabilities, redefining the possibilities of achieving well in life. Uh, her session is complemented by Ms. Lina Prasad, uh, Advocacy Research and Training uh, Officer at Udayan Care. Ms. Lina Prasad is a trained lawyer based out uh, out of Delhi with over 20 years of experience of working with a range of civil society organizations, networks, government systems on gender equality, child rights with focus on child protection and alternative care. Um, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My, I am grateful to the anchor for supporting me like whom food, health, education, and good training skill. I want to say that I am speaking for children who are liking, like me, but they are not giving supporting, then they turn 18. I am giving, supporting, they is when I am able to achieve um, my goal, leave in after care, I learn my stress training. Everyone talk about me. Every are proud of, proud of me. Every they learn think about from me. All my sister help me in my study and become strong i am cheerful because of my mentor i am grateful of supporting i am in graduation and giving 
scholarship. This is all because of the and care. And I am my training skill. If other children will get support, they will do better and become independent. I am a support sports person. I won medal in national game. My biggest moment was that when I won Brown's medal in the Nash World Summer Olympic in Dubai with my graduation other by becoming exa a example, example for other children I stay need support there is nothing that can stop me I want my people government to support young children if I am able to do great then other children will also do please support them for their better them thank you uh, thank you oh, sorry amulaya uh, thank you for sharing your um, uh, uh, it was, you know, really good to uh, hear from you that how you are moving ahead in your life and you are a true example for all children with disabilities. I, I just want to check with Ms. Lina Prasad. Uh, do you want to say something? I saw you uh, speaking, but your mic was on mute. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, you know, each time I hear Amulya and young people like Amulya, uh, speak up and express their thought. It only overwhelms me to a point that I find no words uh, to further add to what they have already shared. But quickly, Wakar, if you allow me, I will just add uh, a few points to what Amulya has already spoken about. Yes, please go ahead. So, yeah, thank you. So uh, just to share with you that Amulya came to Udyan Care when she was very small, almost six years old. And she's been with us. She's 22 today, and she's been with us uh, as a family. And uh, we like when Amulya was talking, I was getting the feel that a proud parent gets, you know, when a child is there up and sharing her thoughts. Um, Udyan Care is an NGO based out of Delhi in India, and uh, we've been uh, working on ch child and youth care for the last 28 years. Um, you know, we started our Sunshine Homes, which is like an institution, but not an institution in our belief and our approach, uh, because we always believed in providing a family-like environment to children who come to our care and protection. Our homes are built on a very different, unique model, uh, which is called twin homes. There are small group homes. And at no point of time do we allow more than 12 children to stay in our homes. And, um, uh, you know, people like Amulya, children with different abilities, uh, continue to stay with all other children. So there is no special home that we maintain for uh, children with different abilities. They are all integrated and they stay mainstreamed in our regular homes um, in a very 
inclusive approach that we have towards care and protection. Uh, after 18, since inception, since the 1990s, when we started our first homes, we have also ensured continuum of care, which is after 18, the children continue to stay in our aftercare home, like Amulya, who continues to stay in one of our girls' aftercare home. And over the last 28 years, we have uh, been successful in, you know, uh, mainstreaming and making over 1,500 children completely independent. Most of them today are lawyers, engineers, they are employed successfully in corporate, uh, corporate. and um, there is a very clear focus on their education, their skilling, and their mental well-being. Uh, so these are the core pillars of our care and protection work. Along with the direct work that we on the ground, we also engage in advocacy, research, and training at local, national, and global levels. This allows us to keep learning about the good practices from across the world and also share uh, our work with the uh, external larger world. Um, in 2018, you know, we uh, collaborated with UNICEF India and we brought out a research report, the first of its kind, that in, you know, interviewed almost 500 care leavers. And we tried to understand the realities of aftercare in India, where we found that most of the children who are transitioning out of institutional care to independent living are not prepared for this transition. They are not uh, provided with enough opportunities or skills that allow them to become independent. And aftercare remained one of those unaddressed child protection areas in the country. But since the research happened and a lot of recommendations came, I'm happy to share that, you know, there's been a lot of attraction on this subject uh, over the last recent year years. And the governments are more, I think, uh, you know, conscious of the need to support children who are coming out of institutional care to provide them a continued aftercare support. Uh, Udyan Care has also been organizing, you know, this uh, international conference on alternative care since 2014. And the last one uh, that we organized was just last December, where eight international agencies came together to deliberate upon the situation of uh, deinstitutionalization and various aspects of alternative care across Asia. Uh, one of the feelings that we get from all these discourses is that, you know, it is not the form of care that matters so much as, you know, what matters is the quality, the standards of care that you provide, even in institutional care. Um, if you look at Amulya, she's excelled in her dream. She wanted to uh, be good in sports. We provided her that opportunity. She's gone to Dubai. She's won uh, awards for her country. And that is what I think makes the difference. It, it, instead of talking about deinstitutionalization of spaces, what we need to focus on is deinstitutionalization of our mindsets. You know, even in small group homes, I think if you're able to provide love, belongingness, trust, and focus on the strengths of the children, you are able to give them a life where they can hone their skills, they can excel their potentials, and they surely can get into independent living with confidence, with resiliency, and uh, like any other, you know, child or young person. Um, one of the other advocacy efforts that, you know, we've been, I think, very successful in is bringing care leavers together into networks and platforms that uh, provides these young people with their own independent peer-led support group, you know, and uh, connecting, sharing their own challenges with each other, enabling them to become advocates for themselves, talking about their concerns, meeting with uh, the different stakeholders, and giving them, them the confidence that they too can give back to society. Giving back to society when they grow up, they are settled and they're independent, I think uh, gives them a boost to their confidence that they too can contribute to the country and to the larger society. Uh, 
in Bihar, we have a project, you know, that is again UNICEF supported. Bihar is one of those most struggling states in the country. And there, when we just went ahead and did a study of all the childcare institutions in the states, there are about 58 uh, institutions in the state. And we found that more than 50% of children staying in institutions were children having some form of disability. And we also found that the caregivers, the staff in the institutions are not at all trained. They are not at all prepared to even uh, plan a rehabilitation for such children. Uh, based on a ground experience uh, for over these years, I think um, we recommend two actions across Asia to progress towards assisted independent living for children and youth with disabilities. The first one is that we need to undertake more data management and research studies that help us understand the realities, that help us understand the current challenges. And if we document the good practices that exist, we can learn a lot and be able to upscale and uh, you know, uh, put in models uh, in place that will assist not only one organization, but across everyone working in this space. The second recommendation that we'd like to make is that we need to come up with, you know, some structured training programs for all, all the social development workforce, especially those who are working with children directly in the institutions so that they, we can build their capacities of how do you actually work with children and young people with different abilities. With this, uh, Wakar, I'd like to thank everyone for giving me, uh, Amulya, and myself the chance to speak and share our work with all of you. And we really look forward to con you know, continuing to keep the connection and working together in the times to come. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Thank you, Mr. Jina Prasad. I really appreciate your hard work and um, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I really see Amulya as inspiration for all uh, young children with disabilities and um, she's an inspiration for all of us and thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on and and, and what work you are doing in India through the Iron Care. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, with this now we will uh, move to our last speaker of the today's session. I will request Ms. Mr. Sumera uh, to please take the floor. He's a person with a physical disability, a journalist and a member of Generation Never Give Up Network Sri Lanka. He will be with uh, Ms. Nimu for, uh, from Care Lever Sri Lanka and will share situation of institutionalization of person with disabilities in Sri Lanka, the legal framework of deinstitutionalization, uh, lessons learned during their work in Sri Lanka and their way forward. Um, over to you, sir. Thank you. Hi, thank you, dear. Uh... Actually, uh, first I would like to say thank you to for this opportunity. So I will quickly move into the my short PPT. Actually, uh, myself is Nimu, and myself with Sumira uh, will be representing oh, the Sri Lanka yeah. here. So uh, I will first start from my side, and then I will move into the Sumira. So uh, may I quickly ask for the sharing the presentation, please, from Sri Lanka? Okay, uh, myself uh, and I am a caliber from Sri Lanka and I am representing Asian very first Caliber's network called Generation Never Give Up Network in Sri Lanka. Uh, where uh, there are Caliber's from all over the country, including the youth with differently able. And myself, I uh, grew up in a childcare institution since childhood. And uh, at the age of 20, I got a scholarship from India to study journalism. Uh, then I started my career in Sri Lankan largest NGO called Sarvodaya. So currently I am studying criminal in investigation uh, from Sri Lankan University. Uh, also volunteering and doing advocacy around the country to prevent the children uh, to be institutionalization and also awareness on the uh, rights of care leavers and children in care. So next slide please. So uh, I'm direct, uh, directly going into the points that I'm planning to share here. Uh, the local context on uh, Sri Lankan person with disability, uh, especially youth who left the care, uh, there is no such a statistics details on this. Uh, I had a discussion with uh, an organization working with uh, uh, 
disability sector and they mentioned there is no tracking system also the data available on care leavers who left care with disability uh, and also yes uh, i agree as it's not in our system but here uh, we have a special opportunity for the children and youth uh, with disability uh, for higher studies uh, which i have seen here so the problems began when they reach out to the society so regarding these issues uh, we'll talk by our main speaker sumira uh, soon uh, after myself so next slide please So this is uh, what is GNGN and work so far and future. GNG is a generation never give up network, which uh, we are uh, presenting, representing here. So here I just want to share a few points as youth group, what we are doing with care leavers, not only youth with differently able, common group of care leavers in Sri Lanka. So currently, uh, we have, uh, currently we have over 450 care leavers with us in this network. So also uh, uh, the person with this, different label also with us and also we got even registered under the company act uh, we help each other especially uh, we are supporting during the covid period and we help more than 350 care leavers with goods pack and the boarding fee also so not only that we are sharing uh, we also give the uh, uh, opportunity for the care leavers through our network uh, scholarship for higher education counseling services legal advisors and career guidance and also job opportunities, uh, kind of job opportunities from our network. We all are the team of Calivers who made this uh, network, uh, the initiated by Association Village in Sri Lanka. So as a group, we are now doing our advocacy program all over the country as a team. So next slide, please. So uh, what our G engine advocacy, I, I just want to highlight the few points that awareness on uh, improving quality of caregivers, because we are not uh, like uh, uh, famous, uh, like giving opportunity for the institution, but we are requesting that the quality of caregivers should be improved. And uh, we are doing awareness for this as a G engine network and also awareness program for school leavers, especially, and the teachers and the parents to how to how to respect to the children who are living in the care and also for the students uh, in the child care institution the value of family to preventing of uh, children getting institutionalization so also we are doing a awareness program for preventing reinstitutionalize of care leavers children uh, so next slide please uh, the latest statistics of Sri Lankan uh, child in care system that we have found that there, there are uh, six, uh, sorry, 379 uh, child care institutions in Sri Lanka and also 10,479 children in care. And out of these, uh, like 80% uh, of uh, the uh, children in care, they have parents. That It means that there is a possibility of uh, deinstitutionalization in the children. So... Uh, the uh, we are finding that the difficulty of socialization for the children in institution uh, as they are so not experience uh, any family connection and they have difficulties in uh, maintaining their relationship. So this is the point that uh, what I wanted to uh, share with you guys. So I just want to share uh, to the my uh, sisters and brothers who are presenting here that don't ever think that you are a uh, person with difficult, sorry, differently. So this is something like I always believe and the, this word is the disability is now moving on to the uh, person with disability uh, or person with differently able. So for me, like disability is person with differently able. You are something unique that you can do something better. So with this, my presentation, I would like to invite my friends and my brother uh, who are representing our network, Sumira Gunasekara. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nimu. Thank you very much. Have you heard me? Yeah. Hear me? Yes, Sumira. Yes. Yes, Sumira. Okay. Have a nice day, everyone. Have a nice day. And I want to say happy Valentine's Day for everyone. Uh, I can uh, see your face, nice smile. smile. So, Again and again, I want to say happy Valentine's Day for everyone. Today is a very special day for me. It's not because of Valentine. It's because of 
this is my first international event where I join. So thank me, thanks to my team to choosing for for this program, Nimu. Put all the congratulations later. I'll get to the story. I was born disabled child. Can you hear? I, I believe, can you see me clearly? I believe you can see me. Okay. Then my pair, I will say my story first. My parents left me because of my disability. I learned about this from my from a note of my mother written. It's just, it's just a painful story for someone. It's just a painful story for someone, but it's very, really nice, beautiful story for me. That story is beautiful because of the environment in which I grew up. Even as a boy, I have to live in a convent background. I think very provincially about I think very positively about my life because of the religious background that I have built up around me. So I, so I think now I am a mature young man. In this life, we are all disabled in some way. In this life, we are we all disabled in some way. You know what I mean. So even so, there are so many disabled people in living in Sri Lanka. Our country has suffered severely from the war. I think you know that Sri Lanka suffered because of war, 30 years. So I think many people in our country became disabled due to the war. It is the same in the North and South. People is people. A war can never be won because it is the loss of humanity, my dear friends. I am a man who has suffered so much society because of the disability. Believe me, the number of times I even thought of committing suicide. When I was young, people saying, seeing man often child, uh, dog, like that, so it's good to suicide myself. So, in fact, I'm very sorry about the laws, regulations in our country regarding disabled people. I'm very sorry about laws in our country. I represent my country, but I'm very sorry about laws regarding disabled people in our country. It is only one, it's, it is only on the 3rd of December that people in our country are reminded that disabled people will live with them, December 3rd. You know what, my birthday also December 3rd. December 3rd is the World Disability Persons Day. So in Sri Lanka, people, uh, people are, I'm inviting disabled people, uh, uh, child, uh, they are helping, and we, we can see the TV programs going on live. So only for December 3rd. So I have seen laws in other countries regarding people with disability. I heard some laws in Indonesia, India, so many other countries. It's very nice, and I'm very sorry about my country. I'm very sorry about my country. The way they treat the disability in those countries and the way they treat the disability in my country is amazing, differently, different from heaven to earth. Very different. There are many institutions in our country dedicated to the disabled persons. Very big as a teens, they are doing this and that. They are saying, we are doing this. We are, we are, we are stand with disabled people. No, not. It's, it's all about the, all about appearance. So my dear friends, my dear buddies, when a disabled person is socialized, the obstacles they face are enormous. The challenges they face in public transport, 
hospitals, at his schools, in country laws, in shops are weird. Weird mean weird. Only those who have faced such, such a situation will realize how helpless they are in such places. Again, I will tell, only those who have faced such a situation will realize how helpless they are in such a places. I know you can feel what I say. My friends, I feel a lot of pain. I feel a lot of pain. I ask you, if disabled people are not a human being, I ask you, don't they feel hungry? I ask you, don't they feel sad? Don't they feel helpless? My dear friends, we all are talk about disabled person, disability. We are we are talking about disabled. Disabled person are unique. We are talking only. We are you talking in Sri Lanka. People are only just word. They are not acting. I'm talking about my personal experience. Now I am a journalist. Now I am a writer. Now in Sri Lankan, if you are saying my name, people can know. People know me. If you are saying my name in uh, Sri Lanka, Sumira Gunasekara, they all know me because I trust myself. But there is a lot of disabled person, they can't come up, they can't talk in stage because of the society made make their they will leave one side. No, they can't say anything. They sing. No, no, no. Disabled person is uh, Another another word. They are think like that. So finally, we need to socialize the nation that we are not special. We have to say that one. We are not special. And that we are simple, ordinary people. We have to say we are not different. We are simple, ordinary people. Being special. Being special, that spe specializing is person all the time has a huge impact on his life. Being special, again and again, I'm telling to you. Being special change the way people look at us. So my, my idea is specializing in person all that the time has huge impact on his life both positive and negative. Young people from many countries who have talked about this program before me, they talk about issues related to the disability community in their country. My dear friends, they suggest situations. My idea is that reminds and suggestions belong to all disabled community in every country in all the world. So I don't have to say reminders and suggestion again and again. I feel good that those things are happening in this world. People become disabled non instructionally It is, it's the way they are born and the, their story. So I have in my life, I had many people say disability due to the sinfulness. Are you a sin fellow, open age guy? Uh, he, he has not had in Sri Lanka, we are saying pau. Pau in our language. Pau means sin fellow. It's it's very, very painful words, my dear friends. I have asked you. Is that really so? How painful it must be for someone so hear the word. Many people have said those words to me in my life. I think we need to change the, those little things. We can't do big things in one time. We have to change these little things, how we think. I think we need to change the things 
little things, little by little. The time has come to change the way the, this whole society thinks. The time has come. You may be wondering why I'm not using a presentation when I'm talking in this story. You're wondering. The, when I was when I looked this program, uh, one uh, in the easier uh, my friend say let show me, show us a nice presentation, so many nice presentation. Now you are wondering this fellow is not using presentation, my dear friends. I just want to look at your face and say this thing. Yes, we accept that we are disabled. Yes, we accept that we are disabled. Do not be afraid to show those world your ability. Again and again, I'm saying, do not be afraid to say, do not be afraid to show your ability to the world. My dear friends, finally, I have to say, we all, we are not disabled. We are people with special needs. We are not disabled. Finally, I want to say, we are people with special needs, special needs. My buddies, we'll try to change this world as much as we can. I have a lot of more great stories to tell you, but time is running out. So for now, I will stop this story until I see you again. I hope I will see you again. Let change the world as much, much as we can. We can't do big things at once, but collection of little things can be the way, but the collection of little things pave the way for big things to happen. So again and again, I want to say, we are very unique. We are very unique. Show your ability to the world. I saw my ability. I can talk, I can write. Now I have a value in this society before I don't have. When I was young, when I was orphan age, I don't have. People say, Pau, sin fellow, are you a sin fellow? Only that word. It, can, it, it, it break my brain. But I thought, no, I am a unique person. Because of that, the whole country know myself. The whole country know my name. So my dear buddies, you are unique. At last, I want to say, yes, you are unique. Show your value to society. Thank you so much. I'm Sumir Gunasekara from Sri Lanka. We will meet again. Thank you, thank you, Sumir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Nimi and Sumira, for highlighting that there, is, there are rights of caregivers. And I think having a network of 150 members in the network, uh, it can you know, create a great impact on advocacy activities in Sri Lanka. Um, and thank you for highlighting that children in institutions are not having access to family systems, which is very important. And a social life is everything for us. <clears throat> um, Sumira, thank you for sharing your story with us. You are a powerful advocate. I really appreciate your efforts and passion towards speaking at your first international event <clears throat> and speaking on the rights of persons with disabilities. <clears throat> you highlight, highlighted about required changes in the laws in Sri Lanka. Uh, especially in education, employment, transportation, health. Uh, we all are persons with disabilities. Um, and these platforms are an opportunity for us to speak about our uh, um, challenges and uh, so that, you know, our voices are taken forward. So it is good to have a youth GDS this year. Uh, this will surely be impactful and governments will bring focus on the youth with disabilities as well. Um, I thank you for also highlighting that uh, we need to change the way we think and uh, we can do that by creating awareness. I think that there is a need to, you know, create awareness on CRPD, um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and it is important 
to understand <clears throat> um, who are persons with disabilities, what are their rights, and um, what is their identity and everything. Um, 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 uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I would now ask that if there are any questions and uh, for the panelists, you can write it down in the Q and A. I can see a few questions and answered in the uh, Q and A. So if you can please ask uh, relevant to the panelist. So there are one around psychosocial disability. Uh, there is a question from Muhammad Talha. How to improve and implement inclusion for all disabilities? Um, any of the panelists would like to respond to this question? Should I uh, request Agus? Yeah. Yes, uh, I can answer that questions. Um, uh, to make uh, 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 the disability or a person with uh, uh, disabilities uh, is more in inclusive. It's just uh, uh, we make uh, uh, we make uh, every uh, stakeholders or uh, any uh, discussion or any uh, policy uh, discourses uh, um, make sure that everyone who live with uh, disability is invited and uh, is uh, heard and. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, during the implementation of the uh, program, uh, we are not just sit there, uh, just invited, uh, but not being uh, listened. To, but also for uh, uh, the for the or uh, our uh, thoughts and um, opinion is has to be counted for the inclusive policy. And I just want to highlight that uh, for uh, progressive and immediate relation for the, the institutionalization, uh, we need um, specific data on how many social care institutions and the number of uh, residents, uh, how many people who are uh, in detention or uh, people with high support needs, uh, it's being uh, reported. And real political will, uh, uh, such as policy, uh, uh, we need to ban uh, arbitrary detention and any form of uh, violence and torture within social care institution. In my uh, case, for a uh, 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 person with psychosocial disability, for a specific program for both to prevent such as the, uh, the diversity for, of uh, community-based uh, uh, support services, uh, funding to develop program to, uh, to stop the torture and uh, that compliance with the CRPD and human rights and uh, uh, adopt. Uh, I think person-centered process and to empower empowerment programs such as uh, vocational uh, training that are needed in the community so a resident will have a job for uh, transitioning to the society that it's much more uh, 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 to make uh, in the society is more inclusive and massive education and socialization uh, of a program to uh, disseminate this issue to the government and other social and uh, any uh, other human rights movement and uh, of course uh, to the society is uh, another important things that need to be uh, highlighted especially uh, the paradigm shift and how to treat uh, human decently like human and of course uh, advanced social protection programs that inclusive for all person, person with disability uh, wherever you are such as concession card public housing uh, cash benefit disability benefit uh, support person or many other uh, inclusive social protection schemes need to be uh, discussed due to our needs because in every region, every culture, every country, uh, the needs could be different. And uh, uh, when we look uh, at uh, concluding, let's say, uh, concluding observation for some countries regarding the, the institutionalization with clear idea, but um, it is still difficult to implement for some countries. So we need to develop a guideline for every stakeholder, especially for the government, for the NGO, for the organization of persons with disability, uh, families association uh, or caregiver association to implement the institutionalization program. For example, the mechanism on how to release, to release a person uh, or uh, uh, many people with disabilities to live within 
uh, the, uh, in the society with education, with skill, and of course with employment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Agus. Um, we have another question on invisible disabilities, such as uh, multiple um, scenarios and other blood disorders are mostly neglected. Uh, when we talk about leaving no one behind, what are the inputs to have better inclusion? Agus, I, I will request again to you to address this question on invisible disabilities and when we talk about leaving no one behind, what are the inputs to have better inclusion? Um, yeah, what are the uh, uh, invisible disability? Disabilities, uh, invisible disability is a, uh, is a person who has a barrier to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, to participate in the environment and the, soci and the social interaction to, uh, to people, but people uh, who are, uh, disabilities uh, in the past, uh, uh, usually uh, they are very visible. Uh, right now, uh, we can see exactly like uh, deaf people, they are actually invisible, uh, especially when they are uh, how to communicate. For example, psychosocial disabilities, they are invisible disabilities. And uh, also uh, some of um, types of uh, intellectual disabilities is also invisible. Uh, but they have barrier, they have a uh, challenge. The barrier and challenge is not uh, our um, impairment or it's not our diagnostic or psychiatric di diagnostic. It is the, the barrier is uh, actually the environment and how the society uh, can uh, um, invite us or uh, uh, count us to participate in uh, decision making in the uh, for the policy making for example uh, the, the process of uh, no one leaving behind it's uh, uh, i'm pretty sure it's uh, 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 correlating with the uh, sustainable development goals that we just want to make sure that there is no one uh, in every country or in every region or uh, 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 whatever your condition whatever your uh, types of disabilities uh, 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 they are should be not left behind for the information, for the equal rights, for the fulfillment of the rights, and for the respect and for the um, uh, protection of the rights. I think uh, that's the. Uh, I think uh, probably uh, any other speaker could uh, add more uh, specific on that. Thank you, Lohar. Um, I think uh, I'm receiving so many qu uh, questions and uh, also on the other hand, I'm receiving so many text messages uh, on the chat box that we have to close as we are over time. And um, um, I would, you know, uh, just um, thank everyone for being with us today and attending this webinar. Uh, really uh, great to have all speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, all the um, uh, interpreters. Thanks all the support person. Thank you, Ida team at the back end, who have been supporting us. Uh, and um, I re I've received an, uh, another chat that you will uh, res get responses to the questions uh, in the chat box, and they will reply to it. And the and we should uh, 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 we'll uh, wait here for the next roundtable, which is on. Um, uh, transiting employment for youth with disabilities. Uh, thank you everyone once again, have a good day.